Okay, so for today, we're going to go over the terms for chapter 15. Now, chapter 15 is a little bit different than previous chapters in this class. We're going to talk about chapter 15 for four lectures. There's a lot of information here. So this video is going to be a little bit longer. I'm going to go through the terms in a little more detail because I think it's useful to understand them. The root of the words and where they come from, because if you understand the roots, then you don't have to memorize 70 different words. You only have to memorize 15 or 20. So it'll make it a little bit easier, I hope. Okay, so let's start with the first one, anadromous. Anadromous uh, refers to type of organism that spends part of its life in freshwater and part of its life in salt water. So a good example of anadromous is salmon. So salmon spend their adult lives typically in the ocean. And when they go to spawn, um, depends on the species as to whether it's every year or every other year, they'll leave the ocean, swim up the river, lay their eggs, and then their eggs develop and hatch in the river. Then eventually the baby salmon make it into the ocean. So that's anadromous. Animal <clears throat> refers to any of the animalia group. So you're probably familiar with animals, cats, dogs, frogs, bats. They're all animals, right? An easy way to think about animals is they're not plants. They're not bacteria, right? So that's, that's an easy way to remember animals because there's a lot of them. The next uh, term is analita. This is a term to describe the phylum for worms. So we talked a lot about giant tube worms. Um, earthworms are an example of annelids. Worms, that's, that's really what it is. Excuse me. Um, I believe, I think we talked about this in class. I'm a little rusty on, on some of these terms. I believe Anna, Anna, Annalita means um, feathery feet. And so this comes from if you, most worms, if you look at them, they have these little appendages that stick out of their, their segments. So all, all worms are segmented. So it's, you know, they're segmented. There's a bunch of little pieces to a worm. And on each segment, they have these little feet like things that stick out. Excuse me. They're not. Anyway, we'll talk more about those in class. Annelids or worms. Arthropoda, um, arthropoda or arthropods are um, things like crabs and shrimp. Um, you can think of them as crab-like things, right? So arthropods. So they have, you know, typically they have um, pincers or some kind of like appendage to, to pick up things, protect themselves. Um, so arthropods, good example, shrimp and crabs. Baleen, baleen refers to um, a couple things. One is it's a type of whale. So there's two types of whales we're gonna talk about. One is called the toothed whales, which are odontocete. We'll come back to that in a little bit. And the other one, I'm skimming to see if it's on here. I don't see it. I guess they just use baleen. Um, are the, the baleen whales. So tooth whales, not surprisingly, have teeth, right? So a good example of odontocete tooth whales are killer whales, right? They have really big teeth, kind of like us, right? They have big teeth that, that used to eat things. Baleen is a little bit different. These are whales that filter things out of the water. So if you ever watch, well, <laughs> we'll watch it in class watch a whale come up and the throat will expand and it will the whale will swallow a lot of water in its mouth close its mouth and filter all the water out but keep all the things in the water right all the krill all the really tiny things you know that's how a big whale eats a lot of tiny things is it captures a lot of water filters it out and what's left behind is the food right mostly zooplankton little fish krill, stuff like that. But 
what allows the water to go out to keep the food inside the mouth is the baleen. So the baleen is essentially modified hair that hangs in a sheet in the mouth and acts like a filter. So if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, the scene where Marlin and Dory are in the, um, the whale's mouth, you can see it looks kind of like, it's like sheets of hair really is, is what baleen is. And if you look inside the, the, the picture of the whale's mouth, you can see it. They hang, they hang kind of like curtains inside the mouth. Bilateral symmetry is, um, we talk a lot about taxonomy when we talk about animals. A lot of the way that we classify animals in marine science and biology, honestly, is what they look like, right? Their shape. And so bilateral symmetry refers to a special type of symmetry where the left and right side of the organism are the same in only one plane. What I mean by that is if you imagine me, if you were to cut me in half this way, like from the top of my head down to my toes, my right side would be the same as my left side, right? There's no other way to cut me to have each side the same. This is very different than if, for example, you look at a starfish. A starfish, you can cut different ways and have the left and the right side the same. A sponge, right? But a lot of organisms have what's called bilateral symmetry. You can only essentially cut it in one direction. So for example, I'm trying to find a good thing here in my, my office. You know, honestly, a phone is bilateral symmetry, right? You can only cut it one way, so the left and the right are the same. I know it's kind of not true on this because the camera is on this and not on this, but it's kind of the, the same principle, right? So two sides have to be symmetrical, the same. Bivalvia, bivalves are bi is two, valves are like a, like a shell, right? So bivalves are essentially two shells. So there's lots of examples of bivalves clams, oysters, lots of examples, right? They have two scallops, right? They have two shells, bivalves. Uh, typically, well, hmm, there, I should say, there's very few generalizations you can give with different groups of animals. There's always an exception, always an exception, but usually with bivalves, they live, actually now that I think about it, there's lots of exceptions, but usually bivalves live on the sediment or in the sediment and they filter water, right? Clams and oysters, stuff like that. Carnivora is um, a, a group that is commonly known as carnivores. They eat things, right? Like meat eaters, right? So dogs, cats, lions, bears, Things with big teeth, right? Um, things like that, right? So they're they're and they're important because things like polar bears and sea otters are carnivores, right? And they live in the ocean as well. So we'll talk a little bit about about those as well. Seals and sea lions too. I mean, honestly, a seal is essentially a dog. That's it's a dog that swims in the ocean. That's really all a seal is, honestly. Cartilage is a specific type of um, tissue that is flexible and soft, but it has form to it. So cartilage is important for, for this class because um, sharks have skeletons, but they're not bone. There's cartilage. So for example, a, you know, your ear or your nose. So if you wiggle your ear or nose, it wiggles, right? But you can't wiggle it too much because it's going to hurt, especially your nose. But you can tell there's structure there. There's form. That hard part, actually your nose is a good example. That hard part right there, that's cartilage, right? That's, that's what that is. And that's what shark skeletons um, are made out of. Cephalopoda. Cephalopoda just means foothead. Cephalopoda. 
head, poda, foot, foot head, an octopus, a squid, cuttlefish. They have foot heads, right? So if you look at an octopus, essentially their head is a foot. That's what it is. So cephalopoda. They're called cephalopods a lot of times. So. Uh, cetacea. Uh, cetacea um, refers to any mammal. Let me think about this for a second. Like whales and dolphins. Those are cetaceans, right? So cetaceans are mammals that are able to swim in the water. Um, dolphins, whales, that type of thing. So cetaceans include tooth whales and baleen whales. So that's kind of the, the order that we're talking about here. Chitin is a uh, molecule that is commonly found in a lot of animals in the ocean. So for example, if you pick up a crab or a shrimp or primarily crabs, that's, I think crabs are a good example. They're shells, the, the hard part that you break or that, you know, if you crack it, that's chitin, right? Chitin is kind of like cartilage and it provides structure, right? And it's, it's very strong. So if you've ever tried to break um, like crab legs open to, to, to eat them, it's hard. They, they have a lot of structure there. Chondrichthys. Cond, C-H-O-N-D, refers to cartilage. Ichthys is just fish, so cartilage fish. You already know this, sharks, right? Sharks and like rays, skates, things like that. Chondrichthys have a cartilage skeleton. <clears throat> Excuse me, so sharks are a good example of them. Chordata is anything that has a chordate, which is just another way to say vertebrae. There are some fine differences there, but essentially chordate is vertebrae, right? Whether it's bone or not is a different story, but Chordates are vertebrates, so humans, uh, sharks, dolphins, fish, they're all chordates. Nidaria. Nidaria includes uh, jellyfish. So, um, you know, if you've ever been unfortunate at the beach and had a jellyfish sting you, you know that it hurts, unfortunately. I've been stung many times. It is, it, it is never pleasant. It always hurts. And it, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's not fun. But cnidarians have a unique feature that no one else has, and they're the stinging cells called, they're not on here, they're called nematocysts. Nematocysts are essentially very special cells found only in cnidarians that when you, when the cells touch something, you, me, a little fish, essentially a little microscopic spear with venom comes out, right, it's a pressure release, so it comes out and sticks into whatever it is, right, so if a jellyfish is floating around and a little fish wanders by and touches the tentacle, the matasis stick into it, paralyze the fish, and the jellyfish can eat it, right, that's, that's the matasis. Nidoblast uh, refers to a, stru a specific structure in cnidarians, we're not going to worry about that, Crustacea, um, also known as crustaceans, um, are essentially, I'm trying to describe how I think about it to make it easier, but I don't want to confuse things. It's essentially, you can think of it kind of like things with a crusty outside, right? Crustaceans, crabs, shrimp. Uh, what's another crustacean? Uh, copepods are a good example of crustaceans. Um, Lots of examples of crustaceans. They are, you know, common in a variety of different marine environments. Drag refers, in this case, it, it can mean many things, but drag in this chapter essentially means um, kind of friction caused by having a big surface area. So, for example, you know, if I'm swimming in the ocean, just myself, I'm just swimming along, I'm going fine. But if all of a sudden I say have a big net that I'm also pulling, that net has a lot of drag, right? It's essentially slowing me down. So 
parachutes create drag, right? So if you're jumping out of a plane, you don't wanna hit the ground very hard, probably. You have a parachute that slows you down and that is drag. Echinodermata, this is a big, big term, but it's easy to remember. Echino, spiny, derma, skin. So spiny skin, starfish, uh, sea urchins, good examples of echinoderms. We'll talk a lot about echinoderms. They are very interesting. I don't see it in the terms, but they have a very special type of symmetry called pentamerous radial. Pentamerous just means increments of five, right? Penta five, like a pentagon has five points. So we'll talk a lot about echinoderms. Echolocation. Echolocation is, if you've ever seen bats feeding at night, um, it's essentially the same way that many dolphins feed, right? They essentially produce sound that goes out and it bounces, it's essentially sonar, it's what it is. And it bounces off and its prey and it can tell how far it is, right? So bats don't see very well, I don't think, well, most bats don't. And they use the sonar to determine where their food is. And if you've ever watched the bat feed at night, it is remarkable how agile they are. Like they're eating insects as they're flying by. Like their echolocation is a very good way to find food. So a lot of dolphins, well, now that I think I think all dolphins use echolocation to find food. Exoskeleton, uh, we talked a lot about kind of the for crustaceans, the crusty outside, right? If you think about a shrimp or a crab, you know, if you ever pick one up, they feel kind of hard. Their skeleton is on the outside, right? So for example, if you eat shrimp or crab, right? If, you, if you're eating them on a, a shrimp, you have to remove the shell. On a crab, you have to remove the shell, right? To, if you want to eat the, 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 the meat, the tissue. What you remove is the skeleton, right? So it's very different from us. Our skeleton's on the inside. Right. And our meat, meat muscle, is on the on that skeleton. But a lot of animals that live in the ocean have exoskeletons, right? So the skeletons on the outside protects all the organs and the muscles inside. Uh, Physopedia, uh, don't worry too much about it. It's a specific group of marine mammals. Um, you just you don't hear this word very often. Uh, gas excuse me, gas exchange is anytime you exchange gas between typically an organism and its environment. So for example, if you want to, you know, if you, a fish is a good example. So if you're a fish and you have a swim bladder and you want to go down in the water instead of up, right, just kind of hanging out, fish, when they hang out, they have gas in their swim bladder. And if they want to go up, they increase the gas. If they want to go down, they decrease the gas, right? And that's gas exchange, right? So inside their body with the swim bladder, at the cellular level, right, the tissue, gas is being moved in and out of the swim bladder. It's being exchanged. That's all that is. Gastropoda. Uh, gastropoda is um, snails, slugs. Um, yeah, they, gastropods have a big foot that is typically like a disc, right? So if you ever pick up a snail, right, it has a foot on the, the bottom, has a shell, right? So things like slugs, you can't see the shell, but they do have a shell it's inside their body. So all gastropods have a big kind of flat foot got a shell, and they also have a very specific uh, feature. I don't see it on here. It's called a radula, R-A-D-U-L-A. -A. Radulas are essentially, they're essentially teeth inside the, the mouth area of a snail, and it's used to scrape, right? So it's, you know, the, the snail will go, or the slug will go to like an area with something growing on a rock, and they'll scrape that off, and they'll eat it. Right. That's, that's how they eat. Gill membranes. Gill membranes are um, 
essentially gills. They're very fine structures that are found in all animals that live in the water, right? So if you don't breathe air like us, like humans, like mam land mammals, you have to get oxygen somehow, right? To, to respire and to, to function as an animal. That's where gills are important. So if you've ever seen a fish, like on the head behind the, it's called the operculum, right behind the operculum, there's like these red kind of feathery features on both sides. Those are gills, right? And that's just essentially, you can think of it as our lungs. That's, that's all it is, is it's exchanging gas in the water and that's how they get oxygen. Hermatypic, don't worry about that. Holeothuridae, very specific term. It's a type of echinoderm, right? We talked about echinoderms up here. Holothurians are uh, sea cucumbers. So sea cucumbers, I'm trying to think of how to describe them. They're essentially a tube. They're an animal that looks like a tube and they crawl around on the ocean eating sand. And you would think, why would something eat sand? But there's things in the sand a lot of carbon. Remember, we talked a lot about dissolved organic carbon. There's a lot of stuff in the sand. So holothurians, also known as sea cucumbers, because they kind of look like a cucumber and they live in the sea. They'll eat the sand, remove all the organic material, all the carbon, and then what comes out of the sea cucumber is essentially sand. That's it. So holothurians are, <clears throat> excuse me, really important for the health of the ecosystem. They really people are starting to recognize now how important they are for, for maintaining the health, especially coral reefs. All right, this is gonna be a long video. So if you wanna pause and take a break, I totally get it. So we're gonna, there's a lot of stuff here. Yeah. <clears throat> Next term is invertebrate. Invertebrate just refers to any organism without a vertebrate. So insects, uh, shrimp, crabs, octopus, snails, they're all invertebrates. Yeah, pretty much all the animals we're gonna talk about in this class, except for whales and dolphins and seals and otters and birds, um, pretty much everything else is an invertebrate. So with an invertebrate, just think, does it have a spine? Does it have a vertebrate? If yes, it's a vertebrate, if not, it's an invertebrate. Lateral line system. Lateral line system is a feature found in a lot of fish. And we'll talk about this in class. It's an adaptation. And on fish, they have scales, most of them, that cover their body. And on fish with the lateral line system, they have a series of scales that run along kind of the, the mid side, right, the side of the fish and they have holes in them, right? They have a single hole. And what happens is that hole in that scale, so if you imagine this is a scale and there's a little, little hole right there, right? That allows pressure differences to be detected by the nervous system of the fish, right? So if you ever watch a fish, like small fish that there's a bunch of them, they're all kind of moving together. You're like, how do you do that? It's the lateral line system. Right? So when they move, they can feel the pressure of other fish and they kind of know where to go. That's the lateral line system. Mammalia, mammals, us, whales, right? Polar bears, mammals, um, any animal that has hair, has endothermy, so it maintains its body temperature and produces milk is a mammal. Medusa, uh, Medusa is a life, um, how do you put it, a life stage? Yeah, life stage, part of, is part of the life of a jellyfish, right? That's, that's all Medusa is. So Medusa, if you've, um, I forgot what it's from, mythology, Greek, I can't remember, I'm a little rusty on that. There is a historical uh, mythical figure where it's, um, her, her name is Medusa and her hair is snakes. And supposedly if you look at her, you turn to stone, that's Medusa. So they, this is part of a jellyfish life because you know the tentacles kind of look like the snakes. Right? That's 
kind of where it came from. Mollusca, these include a mollusk. So these are pretty diverse. I, I like mollusks. Uh, they include things, I'm looking at a poster because I have a poster of mollusks in my office. Uh, clams and let's see, oysters and snails and octopus. An octopus is a mollusk too. Um, a cuttlefish. Yeah, those are all mollusks. Um, they essentially have a shell. So we talked a little bit about bivalves earlier. Bivalves are a type of mollusk. That's all that is. Molt. Uh, molt refers to, in this chapter, um, like crabs, for example. As a crab grows, the shell is hard. So as the crab grows inside, it has to get a bigger, it, it can't, when it grows, the exoskeleton is kind of restraining it. So crabs will do this thing called molt, where they shed that old shell and create a new one, right? Shrimp do the same thing. Actually, molt is a term, you also see it used for birds sometimes, uh, lizards as well. And they'll essentially, birds, for example, they'll lose their feathers and they'll grow new feathers, right? So it's kind of a, that's what it refers to. Mysticidae, mysticidae is a type of whale. These are um, uh, the, uh, the baleen whales. So if you're a whale that doesn't have teeth, mysticidae. Nematoda, um, I don't think nematodes are that fascinating. I mean, they're important, but they're like, I don't know. I don't think about them a lot. Um, they're essentially small worms is what they are. They're um, annelids, right, nematodes. Notochord, <clears throat> excuse me, notochord is, um, if you ever look at uh, a vertebrae, like, um, I don't know, whale or dolphin or, you know, a vertebrae, if you look at it, there's a hole that goes through it, right? That is where the nerves actually go through, right? So if you look at my vertebrae, right, there's a nerve that goes from my brain down to my legs and, you know, connects the, all my body so I can coordinate it. That's the notochord, right? The notochord is really important because that is kind of, it connects the, the rest of the body to the brain, the control system. Odontocetes, we talked about these a little before. These are the whales with teeth, right? Tooth whales, odont. Um, odonto is teeth. I don't know why it's called mystidae here for baleen. Yeah, good. Uh, Dontocetes, killer whales, things like that. Um, osmoregulation. Um, we talked a lot about osmosis. I think it was chapter 13 or 14. Osmosis is, <clears throat> excuse me, the movement of water. Osmoregulation is the control of that, right? So osmosis is typically diffusion, right? So if you got a lot of water on this side of the cell and not so much on this side, it'll diffuse, it'll move down that gradient. However, if you don't want that to happen, you have to work against it, right? Active transport, you gotta use energy. So a good example of osmoregulation, let's imagine we're a uh, clam and we're living on a beach and it's high tide and we're living in, we're in the water, we're eating, life is good, but the tide goes out. And all of a sudden it's hot and dry and sunny, no more water. We're gonna have to spend a lot of effort, a lot of energy to osmoregulate, to keep what water we have so we don't dry out and turn into a, a dry clam. Right. Osmoregulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Osteichthyes. Osteichthyes, um, oste, uh, bone. So if you um, know anyone with osteoporosis, right, it's, it's very painful. The, the, bone, the bones in the skeleton really rub up against each other. It's really unpleasant, but. Osti refers to bones, ichthys is fish, so these are bony fish. Most fish you think of that aren't sharks are osteichthys, tuna, bass, uh, flounder, uh, mackerel, right? They're all bony fish. So if you are cutting one, dissecting one, they have a skeleton made of bone instead of cartilage, which is what sharks have. Oxygen revolution, oxygen, 
Oxygen revolution refers to a period in the past, I can't remember the exact date, not that important, that oxygen became much more abundant in the atmosphere. Previously on Earth, there wasn't a lot of oxygen, right? And it stayed fairly low for a while. But there was an oxygen revolution. There was a lot of oxygen and allowed different organisms to do well. Phylum um, is a term that we use to describe different groupings. So for example, um, we talked about annelids, right? that's a phylum, uh, bivalves, that's a phylum. So usually when we talk about different groups, um, you know, if you want to say worms, right, that's a phylum. If you want to say, you know, I'm trying to think of another good example, starfish, right? Kind of phylum is a kind of like a natural grouping, right? So when people talk about different groups, it's usually by phylums. Pinnipedia. Uh, Pinnipedia is um, seals, sea lions. Um, they're carnivores, right? So they have teeth like dogs, um, but pinnipeds are seals and sea lions. Platyhelminthes is a type is a type of analyst, type of worm. Um, leeches, um, they're not terribly important. Um, they're leeches, right? So if you ever see like, you know, you pick up a fish or, you know, crabs in particular have lots of leeches, um, but those are platyhelminthes. Polychaete, <laughs> you're probably all very sick of these terms. It's a lot of them, I understand. Gosh, barely through the third row here. Polychaetes are just worms. Poly, a lot. Chete, little hooks, right? So when we were talking about the zombie worms, showed you the image with the little hooks towards the rear. Those are chete, polychaete worm. Polyp, <clears throat> polyp in this case refers to a, gosh, how do you define a polyp? It's part of the body of an organism, primarily used to describe coral. So get my little coral here. If you were to look at this coral on a reef and it was alive, each is really hard to see. Each one of those little black dots, there we go. See all those little black dots? That would have a polyp, right? So it's kind of a, a, a soft tissue projection of the coral. And this thing would just be covered in it, right? And the polyps stick out and they are essentially Think of them kind of like the tentacles on a jellyfish, right? The polyps stick out. If some food is floating by, the polyps grab it and pull it in. That's how a lot of corals eat. Not fully, it's not totally how they eat, but it is important. All right, last row, we're almost there. Porifera, sponges, porifera, sponges. Nothing more to say about that. Radial symmetry is a type of symmetry where you can cut it, cut an organism multiple different ways and have the left and right side the same. I mentioned starfish earlier. That's a type of radial symmetry. Um, jellyfish, um, I'm trying to find something around me that has radial symmetry. <laughs> oh, I see one, hold on. ball has radial symmetry. You can cut this ball a variety of different ways and the left and the right side will be the same. Radial symmetry. Cool. Now I have a ball. Uh, reptilia. Reptiles. Lizards. Alligators. Things like that. Scaly things. Reptiles cannot control their internal temperature, right? So we talked a little bit about lizards um, in ectothermy how they, you know, a lizard gets cold, it has to get on a rock to warm up before it can really move, quite frankly. Um, they tend to have scaly skin, like heavy scaly skin, not like light. It's, it's essentially, it's kind of like an armor in a lot of ways. Uh, turtles, uh, sea turtles also, uh, we'll talk a lot about um, sea turtles later on. They're reptiles as well. Salt glands. Uh, salt glands are specific glands, uh, specific um, 
organs, I guess. I guess organs is a good way to describe a gland um, that are found in a lot of animals that live in the ocean. Because there is so much salt in the water and these animals consume the salt water, sea turtles, for example, uh, sea gulls, the birds, um, they have glands that help them get the salt out, right? So if you ever see a, um, we'll talk about this when we talk about sea turtles. If you ever see a sea turtle on the beach and it looks like she's crying, those are the salt glands. They're getting rid of the salt. So if you look, there's actually a stream of salt right next to their eyes. Seagulls do the same thing on their beak. They have salt glands in their beak and they, they get rid of salt through their, their beak. So and that's because there's so much salt in the salt water. Schooling is a behavior that a lot of fish show. We talked about the lateral line a little while ago with little fish. Uh, schooling refers to the term of all those little fish or big fish, doesn't matter, or dolphins, it doesn't even matter. Big groups staying together, right? They're a school, they're a group. Serenia, <clears throat> Serenia is a specific uh, type of group of marine mammals. They include, um, they're called dugongs um, or manatees. Uh, dugongs are in the, the, the West Pacific, uh, manatees are in the Atlantic, Florida area. Um, if you've ever heard the, the myth of mermaids, um, this based on manatees. So in previous times when people would sail across the ocean, they'd see manatees and think they were mermaids. So that's where they got siren right? The, the sirens calling, again, mythology, um, which I'm very rusty on, but that's where um, they get their name, manatees. Suspension feeder, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having trouble here. Suspension feeder refers to any organism that feeds on things suspended in the water, right? So a clam, an oyster is a good example. Technically, some might argue with me on this, but technically a baleen whale is a suspension feeder or maybe a filter feeder. There might be some gray area there, but a suspension feeder is feeding on things suspended in the water, right? You're just, you're filtering the water and you're eating the stuff in there. So I think technically a baleen whale would be one. Swim bladder, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about this a little uh, while ago. Uh, it's a specific organ in many bony fish. It's filled with gas. Um, it's typically on the inside of the body cavity and the, the, the back. Um, cod have a really amazing one. It's amazing in cod. It's like, a, uh, well, anyway, that's another story. Um, but essentially they fill it with gas if the fish wants to stay up higher in the water or they remove gas if they want to go lower. So it allows fish to control where they are without swimming, right? So we talked a lot previously about this thing called the deep scattering layer. That involves a lot of swimming, but it also includes a lot of buoyancy. And swim bladders are a way to stay in the water, to stay buoyant. Teleosteae, ah, these terms. Teleosteae refers to a group of osteichthyes. So they're bony fish. But what you need to know about teleos, teli, teleosteae, teleos, is they're the most, hmm, diverse group of vertebrates on the planet, right? So pretty much any fish you see that's not a shark is a teleost, probably, right? Tunas, flounders, right? These are all teleos. It's just a grouping of fish, most diverse vertebrate on earth. Tunicate <clears throat> is a really interesting organism. It is actually <laughs> A tunicate is more closely related to you and me than to any other invertebrate. So when we were talking earlier about um, chordates, tunicates technically, well, I mean, not technically, tunicates are a chordate. They have a vertebrae column, but they don't have like a bony vertebrae. So if you look at a tunicate, they have, it's, it's really, it's really kind of cool, I think. So if you go on Google and you Google tunicate, um, uh, notochord, that'd be the best thing to Google, you'll see it's actually like these little segments, right? So they have a notochord. They have a very complex nervous system, but it's not bony. It's not a vertebrae, but 
but they are our closest relatives, which is kind of cool. If you look at them, you look at them and like, what? This is our this is our relative. It is. Um, they're all often called sea squirts. Um, they're really common, especially around harbors. Um, they tend to to be on um, what do you call it? The pilings, the the wood poles and harbors. Um, they're very common. Yeah, tunicates are pretty cool. Vertebrate, vertebrata, sorry, vertebrata are vertebrates, right? And vertebrates are, they have a notochord that is bony. So whales, dolphins, us, polar bears, all vertebrates. Finally, last one, water vascular system. A lot of animals, um, don't have any structures, right? No exoskeletons, no vertebrae, no notochord. I mean, they're essentially bags of fluid. That's really all they are, a lot of them, actually. The water vascular system describes how these organisms maintain their shape and, and structure and how they function, right? So water vascular system. So an equivalent for humans would be our blood. Right, our blood system, our arteries, our veins, you know, the blood itself, right? Heart, right? This is all part of our, our inner workings. Same thing. So congratulations, you have made it through the end of chapter 15 terms. So as I said before, we'll use uh, chapter 15 to talk a lot about different things um, for uh, four lectures actually. So there's a lot of stuff here for sure. So. You don't have to watch this all at once. And if you need to rewatch it, it's on YouTube. You can do that. So let me know if you got questions. Thanks for your attention.